that we have learned about the early Middle Ages, let's look at the late Middle Ages. This timeline gives a glimpse of this period. Medieval monarchs succeeded in centralizing the government. The power of nobles and knights declined. Feudalism began to wane. Changes in warfare hastened the decline of the knight on horseback. Gunpowder and cannon also ended the security of the medieval castle. As trade and commerce industry revived, merchant class prospered and turned to newer fields like banking. Free peasants gradually replaced serfs. They were also drawn to towns for work and higher salaries. Through a series of famines and plagues, the population in some parts of Europe was reduced to less than a third. This event also opened up opportunities for the peasants to grab lucrative job opportunities. Late medieval society was divided into three classes, the nobility, the bourgeoisie and the peasants. The clergy were regarded as a separate class. The nobility. Judging from the miniature paintings depicting noble life, it seems to be an endless round of entertainment, riding, hunting, feasting and talking, music and dancing and of course warfare. Entertainment for the nobility provided a stage for displaying fashion. Court of Burgundy was especially notable for fashionable dress. The Dukes of Burgundy and their retin retinues travelled to other parts of Euro Europe for royal weddings, funerals, councils and other events. As a result, others copied the style they affected. Kings, Dukes and feudal lords had established a habit of presenting robes or sets of clothing to men and women of their household. French word for to distribute is livraison and the item as livery or in English livery. Eventually livery came to mean special uniform for servants. The bourgeoisie. Merchants were part of a kind of the middle class and not of the nobility and yet far wealthier than the peasants. A large number of merchants had modest incomes to live comfortably in houses that were furnished with well-crafted furniture linen and china. They lacked none of the necessities and had the means to obtain some of the luxuries of the period. The wives of such merchants were expected to run the household efficiently, mostly through supervision. The peasants. Men and women worked side by side on the land, planting, harvesting and clipping the fleece from sheep. Women tended their children and prepared simple food in, the ho in a house of two or three rooms furnished with utilitarian tables, benches or stools, chests or cupboards and beds. Everyday clothing was plain and serviceable. Men wore a homespun tunic belted at the waist with stocking for the cold with weather and a cloak. Wooden clogs or heavy boots for muddy weather and a hat to keep off the sun in summer or a hood to progress protect against the cold in winter. For women, a gown with a close-fitting bodice and a skirt with moderate fullness was worn. For work, aprons were worn over the gown. While working in the fields, for ease of movement, this gown would be tucked up into the belt and the chemise underneath would be exposed. Not all peasants were poor. Some were able to afford festive clothes of fashionable taste. No major technological changes occurred in the cloth manufacturing process. A merchant became a middleman for textile workers. Tailors underwent a lengthy and rigorous apprenticeship to become skilled in the construction of clothing. Different craftsmen made different items of clothing. Tailors made garment, professional laundry makers made wimples and veils, and bootmakers or shoemakers made boots of shoes. The variety of materials and colors available were considerable. These were imported and exported from all over the known world. The main sources of evidence for this period are art, secular romances, religious works, 
prayer books were hand lettered and illustrated with vividly colored painted miniatures. Stone sculptures on the facades of Gothic cathedrals, tom tombs of rich and high born, and painted wooden statues for churches show the 3D form of costume. Documentary sources. Annual inventories were kept of clothing, given to or purchased by the royal families. These inventories describe fabrics from which clothing was made as well as their cost. Costume components for men during the 14th century included the pourpoint, surcoats, coat hardy, hoopland and housse. The pourpoint, also called doublet or guipon or jipon, this was a close-fitting sleeveless garment with padded front originated as military dress to be worn as armor or sometimes under the armor. These were worn with a pair of long hose. Worn over the undershirt and cut to fit the body closely, the pourpoint closed down the front with laces or closely placed buttons. Strings sewn to the underside of the pourpoint skirt below the waist allowed attachment of hose to the pourpoint rather than to the waistband of the brace, the underwear worn under the hose. The pourpoint neckline was round, sleeves fitted the arm and fastened with buttons at the wrist. Initially worn beltless beneath another garment, after 1350 they were often the outermost garment and were belted. In the later part of the century they were worn shorter, barely covering the hips. Some had sleeves extending below the wrist in a point as far as the knuckles. Footed hose with leather soles were worn instead of shoes. Hose cut with a strap under the instep were worn with shoes or boots. Surcoats, when worn over the pourpoint, were fitted to the body, short in length and either sleeveless or with sleeves. Conservative men continued to wear surcoats over a longer coat. Another clothing feature adopted from military costume was the adoption of the satin sleeve to avoid bulkiness under the armor. Coat hardy is a variant of the surcoat. It was fitted through the waist where it buttoned, then it flared to a full skirt that was open at the front and usually knee high. The sleeves ended at the elbow in front while hanging down in back as a short tongue or longer flap. In the second half of the 14th century, Buttons from neck to hem were seen. Hanging flaps at the elbows became longer and narrower. The length shortened. The edges of skirts and hanging sleeve flaps were often decorated with dagging, a form of decoration in which edges of garments were cut into pointed or squared scallops. Belts worn at hip level were seen with coat hardies. They were either long with hanging ends or short made of metal plaques with an ornamental buckle. Hoopland originated as a man's house coat worn over the pourpoint. The garment was fitted over the shoulder, then widened below into deep tubular folds or pleats which were held in place by a belt. It was constructed from four long pieces that were sewn together at the sides, center back and center front. They were put on over the head. Sometimes seams were left open at the bottom for a short distance to form vents. Fabrics used were heavy like velvet, satin, damask, brocade and woolen fabrics and even fur trimmed. Hoopland Anijam was a mid-calf version. Most versions also had a high standing collar that encircles the neck. Collar edges might be dagged or lined in contrasting colors. Sleeves were funnel shaped with the upper edge ending at the wrist and the lower edge extending in the most extreme versions as far as the ground. Sleeve edgings might also be finished in dagging or lined in contrasted, contrasting lining. For outdoors, garnage, herigo and varied capes and cloaks continued in use. Us or house this was a wide skirted overcoat with winged cape sleeves and two flat tongue shaped lapels at the neck. Corset or round cape which buttoned on the right shoulder and left right arm free or closed at the center with a chain or ribbon. Cape lengths varied. 
Some were short, shoulder length and finished at the edge with tagging. Hair and hairdresses. Hair was cut moderately short below the ears. Faces were most often clean shaven. Style changes occurred in coifs, berries or caped hoods with litter pipes. The new styles were a hat with a low round crown and an elongated pointed brim at the front and one high dome crown and small rolled or turned up brim. In the second half of the century, hats became more varied and fanciful, made of decorative brocades and trimmed with plumes and colored hat bands. Hoods transformed into turban-like styles. Footwear. Lower class men wore stockings that reached knees or just below the calf. Long hose were made in contrasting color to the rest of the costume or might be party colored, each leg made of a different color. Shoes covered the foot completely or cut away closing with a strap over the ankle. Points at toes grew increasingly long. Poulan or Krakow was an exaggeratedly pointed toe shoe. Boots ranged from ankle to calf length or extended to thigh for riding and included both fitted and loose styles. Working men also wore clogs. Accessories included belts. These had suspended daggers or pouches for carrying valuables. Gloves were worn by all classes and were usually cuffed. Some elaborate styles were embroidered. Women also wore a variety of costumes. The main costumes were a gown, surcoat and skirts. A gown or coat fitted smoothly through the body, was worn with tight fitting, long sleeves. A surcoat was a sideless with a low decoll decolletage giving the appearance of straps across the shoulders. A stiffened panel with a rounded lower edge extended to the hips where it joined a wide band encircling the hips to which the skirt was attached. Skirts were so long and so full that it had to be lifted when walking. A vertical line of brooches were placed at the front of the placard. Hoopland was worn by women. English coat hardy had a low neckline and sleeves ending at the elbow with a dangling lappet falling from behind the elbow. Royal women wore ceremonial mantles for state occasions. They were open and clasps across the front and worn with a matching gown. Capes and cloaks and the hairy go uh, were also worn. Fur linings were common for winter. Hair and headdress. Hairstyles and head coverings were wide rather than high. Women wore hairnets or veils and kept their hair plaited and either coiled around the ears or arranged parallel to the vertical direction of the face. The wimple continued but was later worn by widows and members of religious orders. A narrower fillet was worn over a net or fret. Veils were held in place by fillet or chaplet. Fillets of metal for royal ladies in the form of a small crown or coronet were important accessories with veils. Hoods or wide-brimmed hats were used for bad weather. For footwear, stockings were worn that ended at the knee and were tied in place. Women wore similar shoes as men, although never as elongated as their shoes. The main accessories were gloves. Jewelry used were necklaces, bracelets, earrings, rings, decorative brooches, jeweled belts, buttons and clasps for mantles. Cosmetics and grooming. It became fashionable in the late 1300s to have a broad looking high forehead achieved through plucking out the hair from around the face. Dyeing the face and painting it was also practiced. Costume components for men. The doublet was placed over the undershirt and under the jacket. It was short, barely reaching to the thighs and in some cases extending a little below the waist. Often sleeves and collars of doublets were the only sections visible. These parts were made of decorative fabrics. Detachable sleeves also appeared at the close of the century. The hose had a new addition at the crotch. A pouch of fabric called a codpiece was sewn to accommodate the genitals. It was tied shut by laces. Hoopland was later called a gown or robe. It was fitted across the shoulders 
and then fullness was added to the front and back through tucks or pleats with the sides kept smooth. Fastenings were in the front and usually invisible. Sleeve styles were either open at the end or closed at a cuff. Open styles included wide funnel shaped and plain cylindrical sleeves often in contrasting colored fabrics and turned back at the wrist. Closed styles included bagpipe shapes that widened from the shoulder to form a full hanging pouch below a tight cuff. After 1445, sleeve caps were given increased height by small pleats. Sleeves narrowed, tapering to the wrist and hanging sleeves had either wide or tight-fitting wrists. Coat hardies were replaced by shorter hoopland or an alternative style called jacket. The 15th century jacket was somewhat similar in function though not in cut to the modern suit jacket. Jackets had vertical pleats at front and back and shoulders built up over pads to produce a broad full sleeve cap. Usually collarless, it had a round neck shaping to a shallow V-shape shape at front and back or was cut with a deep V to the waist that was held together with lacings. Jacket sleeve styles included sleeves with shoulders that narrowed gradually to the wrist, full sleeves gathered to attach at a small wristband, tube shapes with wide turned back cuffs and hanging sleeves. Towards the end of the century, slashes were made in parts of the sleeves through which the undersleeve of the doublet or shirt was visible. Though similar to Hoopland, the jacket was different in construction. It was fitted at the waist and was attached to a skirt section that flared out sharply from the hips. Cloaks or full capes with hoods were the chief outdoor garments for working men. The huke was a garment worn by upper class men. Like the coat and surcoat, it originated as a covering for the armour. Shaped much like a tabard being closed over the shoulders and open at the sides, it had slits for riding. Worn beltless or with belts, they were considered fashionable. Hair and headdress. The bowl crop was a style that had the appearance of an inverted bowl. Below the cut hair, the neck was shaped. Page boy cut was a slightly longer and modified version of the same. Faces were generally clean shaven. Coif gradually disappeared except in the dress of clergy and professions such as medicine. Caped hoods went out of style except for country folk. Footwear. Stockings, joint hose and separate hose were worn with leather soles or with shoes. Knitted hose were also introduced in this period. Patterns were raised wooden platforms that fastened over the shoe with a strap for protection during bad weather. Boots were close fitting, ending at the calf and closed with laces or buckles. Long thigh length boots with a turn down cuff at the top became fashionable. Accessories used were jeweled collars, daggers, pouches or purses, gloves and decorative belts. Costume components for women. Smock or shift or chemise, the undermost garment for women. Women's hooplands were always long, belted, slightly above the anatomical waistline and had soft natural shoulder lines, but otherwise were similar to those of men. Collar styles included high standing collars, usually open at the front to form a sort of winged effect of flat turn down collars around a round or V-shaped neckline. Sleeve variations consisted of huge funnel shapes lined in contrasting colors or furs and reaching to the ground. Backpipe sleeves, plain tubular sleeves turned back at the end to show contrasting cuffs or hanging sleeves, usually tubular in shape. Gowns or coat or cot refers to women's dresses. In one style, two gowns were worn, one over the other. Gowns were worn wide with sideless surcoats. In France, women wore coat hardies with hanging tippets and necklines cut low and fitted bodices that emphasized the breasts and full long skirts. Sleeves on dresses might be close fitting from shoulder to wrist or hanging sleeves that were wide, full and funnel shaped. In the second half of the century, rigid 
tube-shaped pleats disappeared from women's dresses, being replaced by soft gathered fullness. The bodice developed V sometimes, reaching all the way to the waist. The edges of the V were turned back into revers, lined in contrasting colors or in fur. The skirt was long and trained usually so long that it had to be lifted up in front to avoid treading on and when one walked. The deepness of the V generally required that a modesty piece or filler be placed across the bodice. A wide stiff belt encircled the waist. Earlier styles of the bodice were soft and gathered by a belt. Later styles became more tailored and the bodice fitted the body more closely. When the V-shaped revers were set further out on the shoulders, women wore a transparent linen fabric piece pinned to the garment at the neckline, shoulders and back to secure it in place. Rock was a loose-fitting gown. The bodice was cut with a round neckline with a cascade of gathers or pleats at the very center of the front and back. Unbelted and made in soft fabric, the dress fell loose and unfitted to the ground. Sleeves were long and fitted or short. When sleeves were short, the gown was worn over a long-sleeved dress. Hooded cloaks were worn for bad weather. Open mantles, often worn over matching gowns and fastened with chains at the front, remained unchained. Unmarried girls, brides and queens at their coronation could bare their heads and show their hair. All other respectable adult women placed some covering over their hair. High smooth foreheads remained popular, therefore little or no hair was visible around the edges of the fanciful headdresses. From wider headdresses in the early 15th century to taller structural forms became popular towards the later part of the century. Veils were draped over the entire structure. Also worn was henin. This was an enormous cone-shaped peaked hat. For footwear, stockings were worn. These ended at the knee and tied around the leg. Shoes fit the foot closely. Elongated styles were also seen. Wooden patterns were worn in bad weather. The main accessories used were gloves, pouches or purses and girdles. Jewelry such as necklaces were popular. With lower necklines, necklaces became more important. Military costumes. Chainmail armor was replaced by armor, made by large rigid plates this was first a cloth or leather garment lined with metal plates called a coat of plates. A knight would first don a close-fitting shirt, braze and hose. His arms and legs would be covered with metal protectors. Then he added a padded undercoat called a gambeson and over this his hauberk or hobergen. Next came the coat of plates and over all went a surcoat often belted with a sword belt. When going into battle, he added his helmet and a pair of metal gloves or gauntlets.